It is Tuesday, November 28th, 2017. My name is Ashton Ellett. I'm here with another installment of the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Project, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Joining us today is Senator Saxby Chambliss. Uh, thank you very much, Senator, for joining us. Absolutely. Honored and privileged. If, uh, if we may, just to, to begin with, um, tell me a little bit about your, your childhood, your upbringing. Um, what made you, you? Well, my dad was an Episcopal priest, and we bounced around all over the Southeast growing up. I was born in North Carolina. We moved to South Carolina, back to North Carolina, to Tennessee, and then I went to uh, high school in Shreveport, Louisiana, and the year I graduated from high school, my parents moved uh, to Darien, Georgia, down on the coast. And after spending a year at Louisiana Tech University, I transferred to the University of Georgia, and, and I've been a Georgian ever since. So my foundation was uh, one of being in a family that had a strong faith. My mother taught school for decades. And so I, I understood what um, uh, family and faith was all about at an early point in life. And while we didn't have a lot of money growing up, we had a lot of discipline and a lot of love, mostly discipline for me. <laughs> uh, but I, have, I had an older brother and a younger brother. My older brother's a year older than I am, so he and I uh, always palled around a lot, had a lot of common friends, and um, it was a good life. Uh, one that laid a great foundation for me as I talked about a lot in my political life. We would move uh, from one town to another after school was out. So my brother and I would have the whole summer where we were living in a town where we didn't know anybody. Yeah. And we'd have to introduce ourselves and become friends. And fortunately, we were both pretty good athletes. So we usually got chosen on the baseball team or whatever it might be. And it was um, a, great, um, a great preparation for being able to walk into a restaurant uh, in some rural part of Georgia and introduce myself. And, and um, uh, when I entered the world of politics, was a true asset. Tell me about your time at the University of Georgia. What, what was the university like there in the, in the early mid-60s? Well, the university was uh, obviously much, much smaller than it is now, I think. Um, probably around 10,000 students. And while 10,000 is still a lot of people, it was like everybody knew everybody. Uh, the fraternity and sorority life was very much in profile back then. And uh, everybody that joined a fraternity um, knew lots of individuals and in other fraternities. and. Being a Sigma Chi, if we had a party on Saturday night, the SAEs and the Fidels and, and uh, other folks joined our party, and when they had one, we would go to their party. And it was a time when <laughs> beach music truly was uh, the Athens scene. And we had every big name in the music industry coming through Athens on a regular basis, and it was fun. <laughs> uh, in fact, my wife reminds me a lot that I had a lot of fun and didn't study that much in those years, but um, it, w it was a great place to go to school. Uh, I was there when Coach Dooley came and he turned the program around and all of a sudden football became a focus of every Saturday. So it was, um, it was a great place to be. And, Little did I know, uh, because I didn't have a great appreciation for it then, but academically it was a very challenging place to be also. And it was um, uh, a great foundation for what I needed in later life, which was to have acquaintances all around the state. And during my political years, there was not a town in Georgia that I went into that I wasn't greeted by somebody who I went to Georgia with, so it was um, it was a fun place to be and and a great institution to um, uh, get a degree from. Now, were you politically active or inclined during your your undergraduate years? No, not at all. I participated in 
fraternity life and uh, <clears throat> played a little baseball, uh, but turned out I had to go to work to uh, pay my way through school. So I went to work for a company called Benson's Bakery, which is still there today. I know Mr. Ed. Mr. Very Ed well. Benson and uh, his whole family has been very kind to me over the years. I worked for him in the summer um, selling fruitcakes on the road to civic clubs and church groups around the country for mm -hmm. them to resell at Thanksgiving and Christmas. And then I worked in the bakery at Bogart during the fall and went to night school. So it was, um, uh, they were really kind to me and, and uh, I still see them a good bit now. Uh, and we're reminded of the great times that uh, we had as a family of Benson's Bakery. I guess I guess Mr. Howard would have still been still been alive back when you were working there. You know, he uh, he probably was. I don't remember him because he, Mr. Ed is. was um, he was the the leader of the firm then, and of course his son now runs mm -hmm. it, who I know well and see occasionally, and and. Uh, Again, I'm just reminded of what a great time it was to be in Athens and have the opportunity to be associated with a group like Benson's. Tell me about your, your experiences in law school at the, at the University of Tennessee. Yeah, gosh, <laughs> I, um, uh, I, I knew if I stuck around Athens that um, I didn't have the discipline to to uh, study as hard as I was fixing to have to study, and my wife, to whom I was engaged at that time, uh, had not finished up in Athens. She finished my first quarter after my first quarter in law school, and I had had a good friend who had gone to the University of Tennessee to law school a couple of quarters before, and he said, "You really ought to look at this place. It's uh, it's a pretty neat school," and um, so I ultimately decided that's where I wanted to go to law school. It was a, the right decision for me at the time and um, went, went through nine straight quarters. I never got into the ball spirit. I was a bulldog <laughs> through and through and uh, that has never uh, wavered in, in the least. Uh, but the University of Tennessee, like Georgia, is a great institution and academically uh, the, the law school must have been a pretty good school because I passed the bar the first time out and that was a little bit unusual back then. Not everybody was doing that. But, but uh, we thoroughly enjoyed Knoxville, enjoyed our years at the university, but um, I'm glad now to be back in, in Georgia and associated with the university in a very close way. What brought you back to, to Georgia, South Georgia? Well, when I left law school, it was a matter of where I wanted to wind up practicing law, and mm -hmm. I knew that um, um, law practice was going to be different if I was in a big firm in a major city like Jacksonville, where I interviewed, and uh, or Brunswick, or Tallahassee, or ultimately Moultrie, where I wound up. Um, but I was introduced to a gentleman who was a lawyer in Moultrie, probably the smartest person I've ever been around in my life. Um, he was a World War II veteran and a UVA uh, undergrad and law school graduate. Did not have any um, association with the University of Tennessee, the University of Georgia, but he took this guy in that had those degrees and, and um, it developed into a very strong relationship for 26 years that we practiced together. And my wife was from Thomasville, and she had a sister and brother-in-law that lived in Moultrie. And that's how I happened to meet this gentleman. And um, so we wound up in South Georgia, which uh, was a, a blessing also, and that uh, we're close to family and, and um, now both my children live in South Georgia and my grandchildren. Describe Moultrie uh, or South Georgia generally. What, w what was the area like when you moved there and, and how has it changed between then and now? Well, Cockwood County is a very diverse agriculture county. In fact, it's the most diverse agriculture county east of the Mississippi River. The economy of Moultrie and Cockwood County is totally dependent on agriculture. We have 
lots of small industries there, and um, but the major economic influence is agriculture. Uh, that's a little bit different from some of those counties that are over on I-75, which is roughly 30 miles east of Moultrie. You get into Valdosta and, and some of those communities. The I-75 influence was greater than maybe their agricultural influence. Mm -hmm. And as a result, Moultrie was a little more laid back than some of the other close by communities. But again, whether it was Moultrie, Tifton, Thomasville, Cairo, Bainbridge, we all played football against each other. And I was uh, a big Moultrie and Cockwood County Packer fan from day one. And we just knew a lot of people in those communities by virtue of um, uh, sports relationships, but primarily through my law practice, which took me to those communities to practice with and against lawyers in, in those towns. And so I got to know all the communities uh, very well. And most of them are just like Moultrie, pretty laid back and great places to raise children. You don't have to worry so much about um, the crime rate or locking your door at night. Uh, things have certainly changed, but back then it was really a, um, a great place to live and to raise our children. Now, a bunch of these cities that, that, that you mentioned, Bainbridge, Thomasville, Cairo, you know, South Georgia was sort of the, the heartland of the Democratic Party in Georgia. How did you get involved in Republican politics as sort of a South Georgia lawyer? Well, I never involved myself in politics, as I said, in college right. and law school. Uh, the only politics I got involved with, I ran for president of the Student Bar Association, and uh, I probably won by default. Um, <laughs> the but, best kind. <laughs> I happened to get elected there, and I don't know that that really tweaked my interest in politics because when I moved to Moultrie, I was just had my head in the books and working 24-7 to get my law practice established mm -hmm. and had other more important things in politics to get involved with. My original involvement was just supporting other people who I thought would make good city council or school board or county commission candidates. and. The, um, um, at that point in time, if you were going to get elected to public office in South Georgia, you ran as a Democrat. Uh, if you were a Republican, you didn't get to vote because there was <laughs> nobody in the Republican primary. Uh, obviously, that has changed to a great extent over the years, but early on, my, um, my friendship with politicians was in the Democratic Party just because everybody was a Democrat, every elected official. Um, my congressman was a very close personal friend, uh, Charles Hatcher from Albany, who was a lawyer and who I had gotten to know through the law practice uh, over the years, and I was involved in political campaigns and supporting him. I wasn't as much concerned about policy as I was friendship, mm -hmm. um, and but gradually it became obvious that my leanings, my political philosophy was much more in tune from a national perspective with the Republican Party versus the Democratic Party. And so ultimately, obviously, that's where I found my home. So how did you, uh, how did you make that transition to, from you know, maybe de facto Democrat, supporting Democratic uh, office seekers, office holders, to, to an active member of the Republican Party of Georgia? Well, if you're, uh, if you're gonna be involved in politics, you're, you're either all in or all out. Being on the fringes usually doesn't work because you, you'll get ingrained in a campaign pretty quickly. And thank goodness that's the case because politicians depend on good people working for them if they're gonna get elected and if they're gonna be successful in office. So I was just involved in supporting different folks. I got uh, involved in a um, presidential election on the Republican side, even back in law school, and obviously followed national politics um, throughout my career as a lawyer. And um, we had a reapportionment 
in the state in 1992, as right. we do every 10 years after a census. And um, uh, a group of businessmen in Moultrie came and talked to me about running for the congressional seat that we were located in because of the fact that during reapportionment, our community, our county was placed into a district that was certainly very conservative leaning and really more Republican leaning than ever before. And as I looked at it and, and thought through it, knowing my philosophy again was aligned with the, uh, the National Republican Party, I just, I guess I got caught up in the moment and I said, guys, I'll think about it. But um, after that two hour conversation with about 20 business people from the community, I went home and told my wife what uh, I was thinking about. And I said, I can't do this without you. And she immediately started crying saying, you're gonna ruin my life, this great life we have here uh, by getting into politics. Uh, but at the end of the day, she, um, she signed on and was totally supportive and was a perfect politician's wife. She um, oftentimes, um, people would tell me she was a much better campaigner than me. <laughs> but it was, um, it was at the point in time when you were seeing the transition of the state, and of course it started in the metro Atlanta area, sure. but it sure. didn't take long for people in South Georgia to realize that from a national perspective that they were much more in line with the Republican Party from a philosophical standpoint than they were the Democrats. It's often said that uh, by Democrats, I didn't leave the Democratic Party, it left me. And that's kind of a tired phrase, but there's a lot of truth in that. Sure. And what we saw in the the 80s uh, with, um, and before with Ronald Reagan moving forward, there was just a huge wave of sentiment and good feeling about our country. And it really came from, um, from the Republican side. So in 92, um, you have a primary election campaign uh, and then into the general election. Tell me about that, that primary. What, what was it like? You're a first-time candidate. What's it like running in a Republican primary, and what's it like running in the general against, I believe Roy Rowland was still the, the incumbent. Yeah, Roy Rowland was the incumbent back then, and um, I had no negative feelings about Dr. Rowland. I thought he was a great man, and, and I just thought that I had something to offer, and, and that um, the country was in trouble. We were, just like we are today, we're, we were mired in what we thought was a lot of debt back then. Um, and the policy of the country was trending in a, a way that I didn't think was good for the America that I wanted my children to grow up in. So um, after the reapportionment was concluded in 92, and it took a long time to do it, I didn't. I didn't make a decision to get into the race until like April and I immediately had to qualify and mm -hmm. the uh, primary was in July and I was running against a gentleman from Macon who had been the Republican candidate two years before and then he lost in the general election. But he was running again and he knew how to run and he'd already had all the key people lined up and all the money raised. Um, but Julian and I, campaigned all over South Georgia and had a good feeling about what we were doing. We found family after family shared our sentiment that the country was headed in the wrong direction. And so we, um, even though I lost that primary, we, we made a really good showing for being in such a short time. And when I lost that primary, I immediately endorsed the incumbent who lost in the general and I basically just didn't stop campaigning from the 1992 campaign to the 1994 campaign. And um, it, it was a great personal experience. We thoroughly enjoyed it. And so I was fortunate that I had no opposition in the Republican primary in 1994. And there was a movement sweeping the country at that time. 
and Georgia had begun to trend more in the conservative realm, which meant the Republican realm. Right. We sent more members of the House of Representatives in 1992 than we had ever had before. So the stage was set for when I ran in 1994. How much coordination or, or communication did you have with uh, Newt Gingrich, um, the other candidates um, running in, in either 92, who had been the incumbents at that time, who would be your, your, your colleagues after 94? How much coordination was there with the national Republicans or, or with the state Republican Party, such as it was at the time? Well, there was a lot of coordination with the National Party and a significant amount with the State Party. Um, my longtime good friend who was from Thomasville, Fred Cooper, mm -hmm. was uh, head of the Republican Party for many years. Alec Portament from Bainbridge um, uh, followed Fred and his leadership of the party. So I knew the key players in the State Party and they were very supportive of my candidacy. Um, Gingrich didn't really recruit me. I was recruited by people in my community, which at the end of the day, as I look back on my career, was really, uh, it's really important to me that I wasn't recruited by the party, that I was recruited by people who cared about our country in a significant way, and they were my friends and they knew me. Um, and also in 1994, we, we had under Gingrich's leadership a document called the Contract with America. Mm -hmm. And it was 10 very simple, straightforward points about what we would do if for the first time in 42 years, the people in America elected a Republican House of Representatives. And if we had a Senate that we could work with and meaning a Republican Senate, that mm -hmm. we would do these 10 things. And I began to get a lot of attention from the National Party because it looked like that for the first time since Reconstruction, there was a good chance that a Republican was gonna win the 8th District. And obviously that being me. <laughs> so um, I had all the party leadership all of a sudden sending me money, making phone calls to me, giving me encouragement, coming down and campaigning with me. And I listened, Newt would send me his tapes. I listened to his um, Go Pack the tapes. The Go Pack tapes. Right. And um, uh, it got a lot of, the thing about Newt was he would give you phrases to use. And it's pretty easy to figure out what hot button phrases there were. And I adopted a lot of his phrases. So Newt certainly had an influence on, on my campaign in 1994. And then when he um, obviously became speaker, to have the speaker from your home state and a member of your delegation, it's really important from the standpoint of your committee assignments and anything that you needed to get done, you knew that you could knock on the door of the Speaker of the House and he was going to open it for you. <laughs> and Newt did. He was, uh, he was very good to me. What were the, the sort of dynamics of the, the Georgia delegation at that time, the, the Republican delegation? See, there would have been seven, I believe, seven Republicans at the time, including um, Speaker Gingrich. Let's see. I, I think we had eight you might, back you, then. Um, and my numbers may be off one. I know at one point we had eight. I think it was that first. Yeah, I know it was. Yeah. Um, well, we had uh, Bob Barr, uh, Charlie Norwood, and um, myself. Mm -hmm. That was like 94. Had, seemed like we had one other that was brand new then, and I'm drawing a blank. 90, uh, 92 would have been Jack Kingston. 92 was Kingston, Linder, Linder and Collins. Matt Collins. And then and Speaker Gingrich. And Speaker Gingrich, and then let's go off there. You can edit oh, this oh, out, oh. but and Governor Deal uh, switched yeah, parties. Yeah, Governor Deal in, in yeah. April '95. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, let me go back and talk about that. <laughs> we uh, got it. <laughs> in um, in 1994, after I got elected, there were three members: uh, Congressman. Collins, Linder, and Kingston that had been elected in 1992 mm -hmm. to add to 
Speaker Gingrich, and then in 94, there was Congressman Norwood, Congressman Barr, myself, who got elected, and as soon as that election was over with, or shortly thereafter, now Governor Nathan Deal switched parties. He was a member of, of the Democratic Party uh, in the House of Representatives then, and becoming a Republican gave us eight uh, members on the Republican side and three members on the Democratic side. And our delegation was, was really a, um, a good cross-section of the state from a Republican standpoint. Uh, the three Democrats came from uh, two from the metro area and one from southwest Georgia, uh, the very corner, which is one of the poorest congressional districts in the Sanford country, Bishops. and that's Sanford yes. Bishop. Um, but uh, both um, uh, Congressman Norwood and I came from the same part of the world in that while he lived in Augusta, uh, he grew up in Valdosta, so we had lots of mutual friends, lots of mutual interests. And um, Congressman Kingston obviously represented a very rural part of the state and was very much focused on the issue of agriculture. So we had a, a good um, uh, metropolitan representation as well as rural representation back then. And our delegation as a whole, I mean, the Democrats, um, uh, John Lewis and Sanford Bishop and Cynthia McKinney were the other three, and, and uh, Cynthia was always a little, <laughs> very much of an outlier, but um, uh, John Lewis and Sanford were um, always willing to do what was in the best interest of the state, and we worked very closely with, with uh, senators to uh, make sure that major issues impacting the state were dealt with in the right way. So coming from the 8th District, was agriculture, agricultural issues, the, the predominant um, concern of yours going into the Congress? Well, the two economic influences in the 8th District are military and agriculture. Um, we have two military installations, excuse me, three military installations in the 8th District with Moody Air Force Base, the Marine Corps Supply Center, and, and Albany and then Robbins Air Force Base. And Robbins was the economic driver of middle Georgia. Sure. So during the campaign, I was all in on, on Robbins and Moody and, and the Marine base because all of those bases were threatened by realignment and closure commission issues. So uh, I was focused there, but my law practice had been pretty much uh, general practice, but I was focused from a specialty standpoint on agricultural law. And I represented farmers all over South Georgia, not just in, obviously, in Cockwood County. So I was well known in the agriculture community. They didn't have to explain the farm bill to me. I had litigated portions of the farm bill for years. Mm -hmm. So I knew what the peanut program, the cotton program, and then the tobacco program, which we no longer have, I knew what they were all about, and I knew how they operated, so I could talk their language. My opponent back then had no idea about uh, uh, what was what constituted a farm bill or how the programs work. So I had the agriculture community uh, supporting me, and I had the defense community supporting me, and uh, I was very fortunate to be um, elected the first Republican member from uh, the 8th District since the Civil War, and it was, uh, I still look back on that as a great point of pride. Were you on the Intelligence Committee in the House as well as in the Senate? I was. My uh, last two years in the House, um, uh, I was approached by then Speaker Denny Hastert. And he said, uh, we have an opening on the Intelligence Committee, and I know your interest in the defense world, and I would like for you to serve on there. We had had some minimal um, uh, terrorist activity that had been right. taking place around the world, obviously the Beirut bombings back uh, in the Reagan years, and then the, um, the, the attempted takedown of the World Trade Center by the Blind Sheikh and what later became known as Al-Qaeda. Uh, but it was not a major focus at that time. Um, but he told me, he said, I want you to go on the intel community and I want you to think about it. 
and tell me if there's an area that you want to really get into and do a deep dive into. And because of that limited terrorist activity and because of my contact with folks at the CIA as well as, as at the FBI and our other intel community agencies uh, in my defense world, I decided that, um, uh, and I told the speaker, I said I would like to get more heavily focused on the world of terrorism. So he created uh, what was originally uh, just a subgroup within the House Intelligence Committee, but after 9-11, we became a certified uh, subcommittee on terrorism and homeland security, and that was my first foray in, um, in 2000, the year 2000. And uh, before we move on to, to your, your later political career, I just want to, what's your assessment of, of the, the outlook regarding national security, terrorism, how it it's evolved from, from Al-Qaeda, which was obviously always in the news post 9-11. Very rarely do you ever hear that name anymore. Now it's you know, IS or ISIS or ISIL. Um, and now the, the intelligence committees are, are consumed with, with uh, investigations of Russian meddling in, in elections, both in the United States and France, Germany, um, Great Britain. What, what's your assessment of the, the intelligence community, the, the threats facing um, the U.S. and the homeland? In the year 2001, which was the year that I uh, went on the Intelligence Committee, um, the focus of our subcommittee on terrorism and homeland security was on previous activity of terrorist groups, and we had an advantage over uh, anybody else who might think about looking into that issue in that Jane Harmon, who was my uh, ranking member, who became my dear friend, still is my dear friend, uh, she and I could disagree on social issues and other uh, policies on the Democratic uh, side and Republican side, but when it came to national security, there was no light between our positions. She was a very strong advocate from a national security standpoint. We began to look into the issues of terrorism and actually focused because of the staff that we had, two of whom were former CIA agents, uh, one of whom was a very active undercover agent in the Middle East prior to coming to work for us. and. Those gentlemen knew about Al-Qaeda. We became educated on it. Our committee became educated on it. And they were a focus of our subcommittee. So when 9-11 happened, um, and all of a sudden, uh, other members of Congress heard this term Al-Qaeda that they'd never heard before, those members of my subcommittee knew exactly who Al-Qaeda was and knew a lot about them. So, the speaker came to me and he said, I would like for you and Jane to sort of head up an education process to the other members of the House about the issue of terrorism and what you think happened leading up to 9-11. And the interesting part about that, uh, the situation surrounding 9-11 as we look back on it today is that in 2001, there were probably no more than 2,000 members of this group called Al-Qaeda. Now, they were mean and nasty, and we knew that. But that group of 2,000 put their heads together, and a very small group of them carried out the most dramatic attack that occurred on U.S. soil since the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Um, we convened... Um, the members of the House within a week after 9-11. And we explained to them, or I say we, our staff, explained to about 250 members of the House of Representatives, which was extremely unusual to get that many in one location to, to hear about something like this. But staff explained to them who Al-Qaeda was and to the best of our knowledge at that point in time, what had happened leading up to their planning and carrying out the attack of 9-11. And I had member after member, uh, long time, long serving members come up to me after that 
and say sexually, that's the best explanation of any issue I have ever heard. And your guys did a really good job. Well, going back to the interesting part of it, there were 2,000 members of Al-Qaeda then. Today, who knows how many members of terrorist groups there are. We've done a good job of taking down the core leadership of Al-Qaeda. But what happened is you have all these splinter groups right. that, that um, uh, started up as a result of Al-Qaeda. And today, the, the most known terrorist group is ISIS. As bad as Al-Qaeda was and as reckless and, and um, fearless as, as they were or still are, ISIS is 10 times worse. They have no, um, um, they have no feeling about killing innocent people, particularly women and children. And the world of terrorism has evolved now into um, um, making the world a dangerous place in which to live because the soft spots, the airports, the bus stations, the mosques, uh, churches, whatever it may be, those are what we call soft targets that you just can't protect. You can't, you can't have guys in machine guns sitting around every single installation, every shopping mall or, or whatnot and, and protecting people. And unfortunately, those soft targets are being exploited to a great degree today. The good news is that the United States intelligence community has become vastly improved since September 11. Our subcommittee found lots of weak spots within the community that allowed 9-11 to happen. For the most part, those weak spots have been corrected and we have a very robust intelligence community that has received uh, the funding that they need to do their job. And while the further we get away from 9-11, the more I fear that people have forgotten what really happened back then, um, the, the, um, the, the more we're seeing some of the tools that were given to the intelligence community uh, under the Patriot Act taken away from them. And I do have a fear about that, but at the same time, I've been shoulder to shoulder with those members of the intelligence community, whether it's CIA, DIA, NSA, uh, NCTC, whatever, in some very, um, very strange and dangerous parts of the world. And they have all been willing to put their life in harm's way for the sake of protecting America and Americans. And, and I have a much better feeling about the future of our country today because of those men and women, as well as the members of the military that they, um, they treat as their customer but it's still a very, very dangerous world that our children are gonna grow up in. So looking back, uh, moving back to you know, partisan politics, um, 2001, 2002 rolls around and you were the victim of some reapportionment shenanigans. Um, Representative Kingston and yourself were, were placed in the same district. How, was the how did you come about the decision to, to pursue a race for the U.S. Senate. In 1994, because of the strong feeling within the Republican Party that something good was going to happen in that election, uh, the leadership team headed by Speaker Gingrich uh, appointed individual members of Congress to kind of be a mentor for those of us who were campaigning. And Jack Kingston was my mentor. He and his wife came and sat down numerous times with Julianne and me around our kitchen table and we talked about the campaign and what we should be doing and what we should not be doing. And <laughs> Jack and I became very good friends and we served together for, um, uh, for our eight, my eight years in, in the house. And our districts always bordered. We shared some counties and we shared a lot of friends back and forth and in reapportionment, uh, which we were reapportioned three times during my eight years, Jack and I had some territory that was swapped, so I'd pick up some of his and he picked up some of mine. So we had a lot in common, but basically Jack and I were close personal friends. The night of 
the speaker had told our uh, uh, Congresswoman Harmon and myself to to uh, go to the Capitol Police headquarters, which became the headquarters from a leadership standpoint uh, on the House side. And he, he asked us to be there just to get communications from our colleagues around the world to figure out what was going on and communicate that to other members of Congress. I got a phone call about 11 o'clock that night from one of my staff in Georgia who said that the then democratically controlled Georgia legislature was at work redrawing the lines and that if the current lines held that they had come up to the border of Cockwood County, gone into Cockwood County, drew a circle around my house and basically came out. Well, I had been approached by um, uh, Bill Frist, who was running the Republican Senatorial Committee, uh, back in the early part of 2002, uh, excuse me, 2001, right after my re-election to the House, about running for the Senate, and I told him I had just gotten re-elected, and I was enjoying what I was doing, and the further I got into it, of course, 9-11 came along, and I, I didn't have time at that point to think a lot about it. but. When that happened, I thought, wow, this could have a real fact, it could be a real factor in my decision here relative to what I'm going to do over the next uh, few months. So Jack Kingston and I talked about it because that did, in fact, become the lines that uh, the legislature drew. And Jack had thought about running for the Senate, but he said, you know, I'm really not ready. And he said, I think you're better positioned than I am. And I said, well, Jack, I've been thinking about this. And um, I, I was almost there anyway. But um, I, I, I just think that if I'm going to run for the Senate, now's the time for me to do it. And so I did. And Julian and I talked long and hard about it in advance of that decision. I had my my political advisors telling me what they thought about it. And Tom Perdue, who was my primary consultant in every race I ran, he knew the state better than anybody Absolutely. within the state. Right. And Tom was very encouraging of me to do it because we both saw an opportunity, a weak Democratic opponent and a time when Republican politics um, across the country was getting stronger and stronger from a local level all the way up to Washington, and particularly in the Southeast, and most especially in Georgia, it was certainly on the rise. So um, I did make the decision to run, and obviously things worked out after working 24-7 for 12 months. Did you, did you expect to have Republican opposition, uh, Representative Irvin, Bob Irvin, from here in Atlanta, uh, jumped into the race. Did you expect to have Republican opposition in well, the primary? Well, when you're thinking about a matter like that uh, in politics, you can't worry about somebody running against you. And I ne never gave him being in the race a second thought when it came to my decision on what I was going to do. I knew what my strengths were. I knew what my weaknesses were. And um, I knew that there was an opportunity, and I knew that there was a good chance I could get the president to support me because George Bush and I had become really good friends. And um, I just felt like that the time was right, and it had nothing to do with, with Bob Irvin being in the race. And, of course, it turned out we kind of overwhelmed him. Well, what, did, what does it say about the state party or how the party had changed here in Georgia that a Republican from, from Moultrie, Georgia, was able to defeat um, rather handily uh, somebody from the, the, the epicenter of Atlanta, Republican, you know, the, the base of Republicanism. How had the party changed? Well, here was my philosophy, and Julian and I talked long and hard about this, and, and Tom Perdue and I uh, delved into it pretty deep. Um, I'd been in Moultrie for 26 years. I had a 
a very vast, expansive law practice outside of my home county. Uh, I had been very successful, but more, more important than that, I had developed a lot of friendships in other parts of, of the state within the agricultural community, uh, particularly. I'd, I'd been very active in the state bar. I knew lots of lawyers uh, from all parts of the state, but particularly in Atlanta. And I knew that um, the South Georgia community from my congressional district south, they knew me, mm -hmm. and they were going to vote for me. And if they weren't going to vote for me, there was nothing I could do to change their mind between the end of, of uh, 2001 and the election in 2002. So Julian and I made a decision to move to Metro Atlanta. And Paul Coverdale, who was my dear, dear friend, had died a couple of years before, right. and his wife Nancy, who is still my dear friend, offered their um, uh, spare cottage house uh, out in the back of their house to us as a place to, to rent and live. And, and so we moved to Atlanta. I knew that 60% of the vote lived in a 60 area, um, a 60 metro county area here around Atlanta. So we moved here. I began doing every um, Saturday morning breakfast in Republican circles. I met all the Republicans that had lots of money, those that had no money, those that were uh, very conservative, those that were moderately conservative, and um, I just began developing a network of folks, and I presented myself as me. I'm a real guy from South Georgia. I am, I am not pretentious about anything. I'm, I'm not a, a um, rich white guy running in a Republican primary. I'm a guy that's had my hands dirty and, and worked hard and I'm going to work even harder during this election if you'll see fit to support me, and and I did just that. I, um, I mean, I would get up at five o'clock every morning, and I would be at some Waffle House or cafe, introducing myself, shaking hands, and asking people to vote for me. No other candidate was going to do that, and I knew it, uh, and that just inspired me to work even harder. During that election, I lost 25 pounds <laughs> um, because I didn't take time to eat. I, all I was doing was working. And we had the right ideas. We were on the right side of the issues. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think Republicans uh, in the primary saw me clearly as the best opportunity to win the seat. Plus, they saw me as a person who uh, was very plain spoken. I did not mince words, uh, I was very definite in my opinion on issues. Even if they didn't agree with me, they always appreciated my honesty and my forthrightness. And I think that kind of carried the day for us um, in the primary, and then that transferred over to the general. You, you already mentioned that you, know, you perceived and the, and the party perceived Senator Cleland as a, as a vulnerable incumbent. Why, why, do, why was that your assessment at the time, 2001, 2002? Well, it was pretty easy, actually. All you had to do was look at his voting record. Max is a nice guy. I have great respect for him, for his service to our country. I made that very plain during the campaign. But Georgia deserved somebody who was going to carry Georgia values to Washington. And his voting record was whatever Tom Daschle or the leaders of the Democratic Party I uh, asked him to do and, and to vote. And that's not Georgia values. And we pointed out time and time again uh, ways that he had voted that were contrary to what we thought the values of Georgians were. And we did something really unique in that campaign that has never been duplicated and under the present uh, um, campaign laws that we operate under can never be um, replicated, and that is, and most people do 30-second ads or 60-second ads. Right. We did 15-second ads. And what we did was we took any number of issues that we knew 
if Georgians knew how Max Cleland voted, they would not be happy about it. And in 15 seconds, we said, X issue, um, Max Cleland voted for this. Why would he do that? And it was a brilliant idea on the part of Tom Perdue, and it, and it worked. And political historians have written a lot about that campaign and about those 15-second ads. And of course, now it takes you 15 seconds to say, I approve of this ad, and <laughs> that's why it won't be replicated. How, how closely, you already mentioned um, your friendship and, and support with uh, a support of, of, of President George W. Bush. How closely did you work with you know, the Bush White House, Carl Rose political team uh, in that, that senatorial campaign? You know, in 2002, we, we did not, we weren't recruited, number one, by right. Carl Rove. <laughs> Carl has been very plain about that in his books. Uh, even though we were good friends and they were happy that I decided to run, they didn't come to me and say, we want you to run for the United States Senate. That was a decision we made for the reasons that I've alluded to earlier. Um, but um, I, I would talk to Carl regularly about uh, what he was seeing, and he was interested in our campaign. He was always fascinated by it. And he, he, I remember he used to tell me, you're just doing it the old-fashioned way. You're going from early in the morning till late at night, and uh, he, he appreciated the fact that we were working hard, that, that our campaign was gaining, gaining traction, that we had gone from the first poll where I was 32 points down to never seeing a downward trend in our polling. It was always moving upward. Uh, that was encouraging to him, and he kept encouraging me. But um, from an influence standpoint, they were not involved in the campaign. Now, the president um, was very popular in Georgia back then, President Bush. And he was on my team early on, even in, in the uh, primary. So when it came time for the general, uh, Senator Cleland knew that the president was very popular, and he tried to, to wrap himself in, um, in President Bush. And it just didn't work. Uh, and President Bush made that very plain in his speeches every time he came to Georgia and in some ads that we ran. And um, uh, the, the the assistance that we got in the campaign was in their strong support, not in their policy advice during the campaign. Um, that was done strictly by, by my in-house team led by Tom Perdue. Now there was another statewide campaign going on at the time. Sonny Perdue was running a, a gubernatorial campaign. How do you think your campaign perhaps helped his or how his campaign helped your, was there a, a, a you know, some sort of a rhyme going on there in, 19, in 2002, uh, feeding off each other or helping each other? Well, it was nice to have Sonny in the campaign, and like me, nobody gave him a chance of beating Roland Probably Roland. even less of a chance for him. Yeah, uh, much less of a chance for him um, because he was running against a popular governor who uh, had raised a lot of money and and uh, was not a left-wing liberal by any means, um, good guy. Um, and um, uh, Sonny was kind of an upstart, but he ran a very good campaign. And he, um, he, took, he took the governor right uh, head on and uh, ran some very tough ads. Um, and some of them happened to click. And Sonny and I, we did play off each other. First of all, we, we had the same philosophy. He was, even though he was a converted Democrat, <laughs> um, I was a converted uh, Democrat. And um, uh, we both adhered to a very strong conservative philosophy. He wanted to get the state straightened out. I wanted to help get the country straightened out. And um, because of our friendship, we travel the state together a lot. Our wives travel the state, sometimes with us, sometimes independent of each other. Um, 
and we both carried the same message. When I was in, in Bainbridge talking to a group about whatever in my campaign, I would always mention Sonny and he was doing likewise. And that really did, um, that helped both of us. Uh, when President Bush came to town, he would speak about both of us in the same vein in a very positive way. Um, and we got to the, we got to the Friday night before the, well, let me back up a minute. We. I never paid attention to polling numbers, but I pay attention to polling trends. And what I wanted to do was to peak from an election standpoint on November the, the 8th, I believe it was that year. Um, and my trends never wavered. They were always up. And we knew two weeks out from the election that we were gonna win. Nobody gave us a chance even then there was a poll that came out on the Friday before the election on Tuesday done by the Atlanta Journal <coughs> that said that, that we were gonna lose by, gosh, I don't know, 11 points or something <laughs> like that. And uh, we knew that was false. Um, and Governor Barnes knew that was not right. Governor Barnes, uh, later told me that he knew on that Friday night that we were going to win. Both our polling and his polling showed that he was likely to win on the next Tuesday. But at the end of the day, the voters turned out for Sonny and they turned out for me, and we, we, um, we had more votes than, than Governor Barnes and Senator Cleland, and after having both worked hard together and played off each other, we were both successful. Tell me about your, your two Senate colleagues that you served with during your time in the Senate, uh, Zell Miller and Johnny Isaacson. It's a pleasure and a joy to serve with both those gentlemen. Uh, obviously, Zell was there in the Senate when I was elected. He had campaigned hard for Max Cleland. He came to me immediately and he said, you know, we have a tradition in the United States Senate that a sitting senator walks down the aisle with a newly elected senator when he is sworn in and you sign the book, and I hope you will let me walk down the aisle with you. And I said, Zell, by all means. And because I was willing to suck it up and say politics is politics, uh, Zell was likewise. He's a good man, number one. He's a good politician, but he's also just a great public servant. He cares about this country, and he particularly cares about the Georgia that he represented. And we had a Republican administration, um, and Zell's philosophy was very much in line with a lot of the uh, ideas of the Bush administration. So Zell and I got along extremely well. We talked regularly. He deferred to me on things like judicial appointments and whatnot. But um, for the most part, when it came to announcing something happening in the state, Zell and I were there together. Mm -hmm. we, we never, uh, some senators from states, uh, they compete with each other to see who can be the first to get out the press release. <laughs> Zell and I never did that. Then when Johnny got elected, it, it presented an opportunity for me to, I had served with him in the House, but um, uh, this was a special uh, opportunity to serve in the United States Senate with a guy that I met as a <clears throat> student at the University of Georgia in, in uh, 1962, when he and I both entered the university. We became friends early on, and we remain friends even today. We're very, very close friends. And uh, we don't share just political philosophy. We share moral values, and, and um, we both like a glass of red wine every now and then. And, and Johnny was, uh, again, one of these folks that from a, from a standpoint of serving our state, we made it very plain to our staff that it starts with us. 
we do everything together when it comes to announcing grants or talking about anything going on in the state. There is no competition with us. And Johnny and I would talk about issues maybe four or five times a day. It could be even as much as 10 or 12 times a day. We would talk about what's happening in the state, what's going on on the floor of the Senate. Uh, we would discuss the pros and cons of a vote that was coming up that has a huge impact on the country or our state. If there was an issue that needed to be addressed, like the water issue um, that was so critical, we were both right there with, with both feet. And to this day, um, if you ask me the one thing I miss the most about the Senate, it's my friends, but particularly my day-to-day re -day relationship with Johnny Isaacson. I really, really miss that because he's such a good guy and has been such a dear friend for over 50 years now. What was different about serving in the, in the Senate versus the House of Representatives? How, how different was that experience? Well, the House is a great institution. I thoroughly enjoyed my eight years in the House. Would not take a minute for any of it. But in the House, you're one of 435. Right. In the Senate, you're one of 100. So I get elected to the Senate in November of 2002. In December of 2002, Carl Rove called me up and he said, the president's um, thinking about his State of the Union speech that he's going to be given next month, and he would like to know your ideas about it and, and uh, see what input you'd like to have and, and what he's going to talk about. And at first I thought he had the wrong number. <laughs> I'd been in the House for eight years. They never called me. No White House ever called me and asked me about my ideas of what the president ought to talk about. But that's the kind of difference there is in the House and the Senate. Um, the House does lots and lots of very important work for the country. But the Senate does more. They do everything the House does. Plus, we're in charge of all um, judicial confirmations as well as confirmation of any other member of the executive team. And that involves thousands of confirmations. Um, we're, the Senate is required to approve treaties, and we have lots of treaties from time to time that have to be approved. And just from the sheer numbers of 435 versus 100, the White House treats you differently because they need votes in the House, but they really need your vote when you're a member of 100 versus 435. So I think that was probably the biggest difference that I saw. And the scope of the issues all of a sudden changed. Um, my focus as a member of the House was on my district, and primarily on my district. That's who I represented. That meant that I needed to look out for the world of agriculture and defense. It just so happens that those two issues are also the two major economic issues in our state. Agriculture is the number one industry in the state, has been, probably always will be, but defense is not far behind it. We have more installations per capita than any states other than Texas and California. Um, and so um, I was able to align myself uh, pretty closely with what I had been doing on those issues, but all of a sudden, issues of housing, of nutrition, um, of um, the water wars, uh, what's going on at the port, all of those things all of a sudden became very front and center with me. In addition to that, issues of, of what was happening in, <clears throat> in New York as it might impact national security was, uh, was a major concern for me or something that involved agriculture as I uh, worked my way up the ladder to be chairman of the Ag Committee, something that was happening in Oregon or California in the world of agriculture was all of a sudden very important to me. So it just, it changed the whole dynamics of, of my political life.
because of the expanse of, of the issues that you have to deal with, in addition to the fact that uh, you're one of 100 versus one 435. What do you think you're, if you, looking back on it, what do you think your, your, your key or top accomplishments as a U.S. Senator were during your 12 years there? Well, the most significant thing I, I did, will, I will always look at as being the work we did on the Gang of Six. Uh, Mark Warner and I put that group together in 2010 because we were concerned about the direction the country was going in and Republicans and Democrats weren't, weren't concerned with uh, this mounting debt that we had out there. At that time, it was $14 trillion. Today, it's um, $22 trillion <clears throat> and rising every day and nothing's being done about it. But Mark and I became concerned about that together and we knew there were other Republicans and Democrats that, that were concerned about that versus just being reelected. And we were able to put a very small uh, group together, frankly, at the direction of a larger group who said, you guys have been working on this, we're all concerned about it, but a smaller group needs to come up with a plan and you guys need to do it. That's how the Gang of Six was, was formed. And Mark and I led that group, and um, at the end of the day, we came up with a very solid plan from a fiscal standpoint of how we should address issues that are going to impact generations to come, and most especially, how we're going to deal with this issue, this, this mounting national debt that keeps growing every year. And it wasn't rocket science. Uh, at the end of the day, for us, it was a matter of reducing spending, reforming entitlements and reforming an antiquated tax code that would invigorate the economy and allow the economy and jobs to grow in a way that was positive. And uh, that's what we came up with. And, and um, we, um, we took a lot of pride in that end product. Our, our leaders on both sides uh, were a, a strong headwind in opposition to us because they knew that their members were going to have to take some hard and tough votes on reducing spending, taking Medicare and Social Security, reforming them and making them last forever versus going bankrupt, which is where they're headed today. Um, and then taking this tax code that um, is uh, worn out and, and antiquated and uh, instead of um, uh, being conducive from an economic growth standpoint, it was really a hindrance because it's, it's gotten so complicated. Well, even though we didn't accomplish our goal at the end, which mirrored the, what was then known as the Simpson-Bowles Commission, um, we did create an atmosphere that future Congresses would begin looking at and what you're seeing today is that we've seen a reduction in spending. It's through a, an unusual animal that we call sequestration. Sequest. It's a poor way to do business, but it's reducing spending. And uh, right now we're seeing a debate on the floor of the Senate on reforming the tax code. Not rocket science. Similar type things to what we were talking about. And ultimately, um, the House and the Senate are going to have to deal with reforming entitlements and, and um, dealing with long-term health care issues, long-term Social Security issues, and, and other matters like that. That was my single um, uh, greatest accomplishment and thing that satisfies me more than anything else to this day. I, I never shied away from controversial issues. That's what people sent me there for. So whether it was immigration or the, um, <clears throat> the situation we saw ourselves in following the collapse of the financial community in 2008, I knew we had to take that head on. It was not going to be easy. And, um, you know, I was willing to make those hard and tough votes to do what needed to be done to get the country back on track. Turns out it worked. And... I've had any number of people who came to me and said, wow, I didn't agree with what you were doing back there, but, you know, you guys were right. 
I've had that both from a gang of six perspective as well as any number of other votes that I made over the years. Do you think comprehensive, since you mentioned immigration, comprehensive immigration reform, what do you think the prospects for that are, both in the short term or in the long term, up in Washington? I don't think there's a very great likelihood in the near term of seeing comprehensive immigration reform. The reason is it is such a complex issue that trying to get 535 folks really educated on the real problem, which is number one, how we're gonna deal with these tens of millions of individuals who are here illegally uh, without rounding them up and shipping them back, which is not gonna happen but let's deal with them in a reasonable, rational way. Uh, secondly, how are you going to secure our border? Because if you don't secure the border, then 20 years from now, Congress will be dealing with this same issue again. And then uh, thirdly, how are you going to deal with this issue of, of uh, U.S. citizenship? Uh, is it right that a couple from... Uh, um, some other part of the world vacations in the United States and they happen to have a child born here while they're vacationing, that child is a U.S. citizen. Is that the philosophy that we ought to have today versus what it has been all the history of our country? Um, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but you take all of those issues and try to deal with them, not going to happen. So what needs to happen is there need to be some selective strikes we should deal with this issue, and I think Congress will deal with it in the short term, on what to do with these kids who are here, uh, not of their own choosing, but of the choosing of their parents mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who brought them here. They are not citizens, but they have grown up here all their lives. They speak perfect English. Uh, they graduated from our, our high schools, and a lot of them are going to college. Uh, but they're still here illegally. What are we gonna What are we gonna do with those the, folks? The so-called dreamers or the yeah, DACA the dreamers. Um, I think that needs to be dealt with first, and I think it will be, and I think that will be a stepping stone into how we deal with their parents. And if somebody is, uh, you know, we have to remember we're a country founded by immigrants. Every one of us uh, has some sort of immigrant in our background. And uh, they did it legally versus doing it illegally. Um, I've never been a fan of giving somebody a favor for coming here illegally. But I think if they want to work to become a U.S. citizen, there's a way they ought to be able to do it, which is get in line with everybody else. We got laws that deal with that. So I think there's some, uh, there's some, parts of the comprehensive immigration law that we can deal with mm -hmm. in the short term, but passing an overall comprehensive immigration bill, I just don't see happening. When you, you decided not to seek re-election in, in 2014, how had the Senate changed since you first got there in 2003, as opposed to when you left in January of, of 2015? Well, the Senate has always been <clears throat> the political body in Washington that, as Washington and Jefferson talked about, was the, the saucer with the House being the cup uh, that would allow the boiling tea to uh, spill over in and it would cool down in, in the saucer or the Senate. And um, that the, the Senate could always act in a more bipartisan way to really solve issues. It, required 60 votes to get things done. Therefore, Republicans and Democrats had to work together. Um, and during my years in the Senate, particularly the first uh, six years, I think that's what we saw. I think we saw a, a Senate that really did want to work together. Um, then uh, things started to, started to change. And it may have even been during the last years of the Bush administration. They started to move in another direction. And it was a direction which was not good. You saw more partisanship exhibited in the Senate. 
um, the old guard, the Robert Birds and the uh, Bob Doles and the Ted Kennedys, um, began to, <coughs> in Dole's case, he had left the Senate, but with Byrd and Kennedy, they were on the backside of their careers. And guys like that had kind of held the Senate together and they appreciated the tradition of the Senate. Uh, when, I was, uh, when I was elected to the Senate, I was appointed to the Judiciary Committee. And I was, um, uh, as a member of the Judiciary Committee, <clears throat> I, I was selected to chair the Immigration Subcommittee. And my ranking member was Ted Kennedy. I had been in the Senate three days, had been sworn in three days, before Ted Kennedy came to me, and I didn't even know him introduced himself, said, I'm going to be your ranking member, and you and I need to have a sit down and let's talk about things we want to accomplish together as we work within this subcommittee. And um, I said, great, Senator. I said, I'll get my scheduler to call your office and I'll come see you and we'll do it. He said, no. Nope. He said, the way the Senate works is you're the chairman. I will call your office and I will come to your office and we'll have a sit down. And I thought, wow, <laughs> that's really, uh, for a guy like that who like him or love him, he was an icon. Uh, I mean, uh, like him or dislike him, he was an icon in the Senate. And uh, he was coming into the office of this brand newly elected freshman senator to discuss how we're going to work together. And we did. He and I got some things done in, in that subcommittee that were... Um, significant and meaningful, and it was because the two of us were willing to compromise. Unfortunately, compromise over the years has become a four-letter word in, in the United States Senate as well as in the House, and somehow we've got to get back to that. And I don't, there is no silver bullet on how we do it, but somehow we do have to get back to that. You know, zooming out a bit, um looking at the, the evolution of the Republican Party or the two-party system in Georgia. You touched on it briefly, but what do you think are the primary factors that made the Republican Party uh, an actual competitive party in the 1980s, 1990s, and, and around the turn of the millennium? I think primarily it was a realization that if you are a conservative, if you believe that the philosophy of Ronald Reagan is your philosophy, then you as a Democrat should be a Republican. I think Ronald Reagan had more to do with changing uh, conservatives around the country who, were, who professed to be Democrats into becoming Republicans because they finally realized that, hey, you know, I really am more in tune with what this guy is saying and the way he's leading the country. Um, and um, I think particularly in Georgia, we, we really saw that because Georgia was strongly supportive of President Reagan in both races and, and um, he just had the kind of, not just, um, and I, I say that, we better go back repeat right. that. Um, I think particularly in Georgia, Ronald Reagan had a strong influence. Um, he, um, he just had a strong following in our state. And you could tell by listening to him as that if you were a conservative Georgia Democrat, this guy really thought the way you thought. And therefore, if, if that was the case, then you ought to be following that philosophy of that party rather than the Democratic Party. You know, we, we've, we've you know, sort of covered a, a breadth or a stretch of time where the Republicans went from a minority party to a majority party, not just the congressional delegation, both U.S. senators, every statewide constitutional office, governor's mansion. What do you think the, the greatest danger to that Republican majority here in Georgia, or, or really the South in general, 
um, is, is. Is there a danger that the Republican Party might not be the majority party someday? I think there's a very real danger that could be the case. And the worst thing Republicans can do is become complacent, um, become of a mind that, you know, our philosophy is the only philosophy, and if you don't believe like we do, then we're not willing to listen to you. Um, and uh, if we do that, then there's a very, very good chance that um, uh, Democrats in the future in Georgia are going to have some successes that they're not having right now. On the other hand, if we engage more young people, we engage more Hispanics, uh, we engage more African Americans into understanding what the Republican Party really stands for, then I think Republicans will dominate in Georgia for a long time to come. But I think it's, it's gonna, you're going to have to have a mindset and carry out that kind of plan uh, to educate voters about what we really stand for. If you don't, if you have this infighting within the Republican Party, if you have that unwilling to compromise uh, uh, position on every issue, then we're headed for trouble. Do you think, what do you think that the key differences are between, say, Georgia Republicans, Republicans here in state government, as opposed to Republicans at the national level? Like they, they used to say you were a Georgia Democrat and a national Democrat. Is there such a distinction for Republicans? I think there used to be, but I don't, I don't know that you could say that now. Um, I think Georgia pretty much mirrors from a philosophical standpoint the Republican Party at the national level where we um, um, believe in strong faith, we, we believe in strong national security, we believe in, in lowering taxes and giving people more individual rights and freedoms. We're strong on issues like the Second Amendment. Um, and that, I mean, that's what got our current president elected. And um, I think as long as Georgia Republicans believe that, um, I think we'll always be in line with the National Party. Since you brought up <clears throat> President Trump, you were, you were referring to, to Ronald Reagan and the principles of Ronald Reagan. There's some discrepancies between the incumbent president and Ronald Reagan's philosophies on, in, in terms of immigration, uh, globalism, free trade. How can the Republican Party uh, reconcile the, the, the policy values, the policy priorities of, of a Trump administration with what has been historically the priorities of the Republican Party, of, of Ronald Reagan, of, of both President Bush's? How, how does that work out? It, is it going to work out? Well, I think what you have to remember in that vein is that times change. Um, Philosophies haven't changed. I'd say the philosophy of, of uh, President Bush, uh, both H.W. and, and uh, 43, as well as President Trump, is pretty much in line with the philosophy of Ronald Reagan. Now, being able to communicate that uh, is a little different, but, you know, his basic values were, were um, um, strong support at home, uh, strong national uh, defense and um, uh, lower taxes, more individual rights and freedoms, uh, less regulation was better. I think you're seeing a lot of that today with, uh, with the current administration, at least philosophically. I think there's a, a major difference that I see in the Trump administration is that, you know, Washington is Washington and you can't transform it with one election. You simply cannot do it overnight. And there are certain things that you have to do within the system. You know, Ronald Reagan once said that a good leader will take 70% of what he wants and consider that a victory in any piece of legislation. Uh, now we're seeing too many people in Washington insist on getting 100%. 
Uh, I think President Trump is enough of a deal maker to understand that getting 70 percent is a pretty good deal. So I think there's some of that same philosophy there. It just comes out differently when, when President Trump says it, primarily because he says what he, it's what comes out. Ronald Reagan was a lot more cautious with his words. And um, we didn't have social media back then. And let's don't downplay the importance of social media. It has had a huge impact on the elections beginning in 08 with uh, President Obama's first term. Sure. And um, uh, Obama used it very effectively. Uh, John McCain nor Mitt Romney used it very effectively. Uh, President Trump has used it effectively, and it's made a difference in the political world. Do you think over time the, the, the party let me, let me rephrase that question. What do you think the, the long-term impact of a President Trump, an unlikely president, an unlikely nominee um, from the beginning, what do you think the long-term impact of, of a President Trump on the Republican Party, on the Republican pr brand might be? Well, I hope it's going to be positive. Uh, I mean, only history will, will tell, but um, you, you have to give the guy credit with respect to eliminating regulations, which he said he was gonna do, of appointing conservative judges to the bench, which he said he was gonna do, and in trying to do things like repeal Obamacare, getting tax policy through. Now, he struggled, but he's gotta have the help of Congress. If he, if he has a Congress that, that um, uh, doesn't wanna help him or simply does not help him, then uh, it's not going to have a very positive impact on the Republican Party moving forward. But uh, it's amazing what one victory will do, and if he has a victory on the issue of tax reform, that will bleed over into another victory on the next issue that comes down the line. And I think he can, he can do a lot of positive things um, still in the next three years that he has in, in office. But it's going to have to be with a Congress that he wants to work with, he's willing to work with, and that is willing to work with him. When you, when you announced your retirement from the Senate, you said that you were going to, about your life after the Senate, you were going to sit on the porch and, and sip whiskey. Now, is this, this bourbon, Tennessee whiskey, scotch? Uh, well... It's, All of the uh, above. Yeah, yeah. Wh whatever somebody wants to bring me with. <laughs> no, I uh, obviously that was just a phrase that um, happened to come out when I uh, was discussing that. But I, you know, what I what I said in that announcement, what I still feel today is I was just totally frustrated my last four years in the Senate. I'm a guy that likes to get things done. People didn't send me to to Washington to vote on the easy matters and not take on the hard matters. You could send anybody to do that. Uh, they sent me there to represent their values and to do things that the United States needed to do to get itself in fiscal order, uh, in immigration order, and in any number of other issues that, that we had to deal with. And um, you know, you can only butt your head against the wall so many times until you look at it and you say, you know, I keep running into these stone walls. Maybe it's just time for some fresh ideas and somebody with um, a newfound energy to come up here and, and see if they can have better success at it than I've, I've been able to have. Although we had a lot of, a lot of success, um, when Harry Reid made the decision to eliminate the 60-vote requirement on the executive calendar in, in um, what, 2013, I guess, um, that changed the whole complexion of the Senate. And it, it made the minority party less important. And I thought it was wrong then still think it was wrong today. It's the worst thing that's happened to the Senate. And unfortunately now, we're, uh, we've 
require only 51 votes for Supreme Court justice. We got a great Supreme Court justice. I'm happy he's there, but I believe you could have gotten 60 votes uh, if it had been worked right. And um, I, I, I just, I, I just felt so frustrated that um, I wanted to go do something else. I, I wanted to to take the experiences that I had had and I wanted to move on to the next phase of my life. I never intended to go to Washington to stay there till I die. Uh, and I'm still a young guy in my mind. Um, my energy level was still high, my health was good. I knew I wanted to continue to work and part of that work has been giving back to my state but also part of it has been continuing to work within the intelligence community of the United States. I'm on, I've been on every advisory board within the intel community. So I still have my voice heard there, and um, I, um, I'm not taking as much time off sitting on the back porch as I intended to, <laughs> uh, but I do get to spend more time with my grandchildren, and um, uh, I don't have to ask Harry Reid if I can leave this afternoon and go to my grandchildren's ballet or, or uh, my grandson's graduation or whatever it may be. I just go. And um, I, I don't regret one minute of the 20 years I served. Um, I, I made so many dear friends around the world and I'm very thankful for that. Uh, people of Georgia were very good to me in giving me that opportunity. But I just knew after 20 years, it was just time to move on. That's a long time to be in Washington. Well, Senator, anything else you'd like to record for posterity's sake before we hang it up? Hmm. I think we've covered about everything I can think of. <laughs> well, Senator, thank you very much for participating in the Russell Library's Two-Party Georgia uh, Oral History Project. Um, really do appreciate all your time. Thank you very much, sir. Glad to do it, Ash. Thank you.